is season two of Pasco Podcast, a series where we discuss leadership and public service. We'd like to thank our sponsors, the 550,000 plus residents of Pasco County, as represented by the Board of County Commissioners. It's through their trust and empowerment of our workforce and leadership team that we're able to bring you this podcast. We created this podcast to help public servants build leadership skills and leverage them for success by sharing the experiences of our peers. Hi, I'm Dan Biles and welcome to our 12th episode of Pasco Podcast. Now, joining us today is Community Development Director Marcy Esberg and Housing Program Manager Jeff McKittrick. So I'm just going to start off if you just kind of want welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here today. And tell us a little bit about yourself, audience, a little bit about yourself, how you came to Pasco. And then uh, because your roles are kind of not necessarily out there a lot, kind of what your role really is in community development and doing the Housing Program Manager. And either one can start. Go ahead, Marcy. So it's great to be here. And I uh, am originally from New Jersey. So I always like to give a shout out to that because we have a lot of people in our office from New Jersey, yeah. actually. Mm-hmm. So born and raised in New, New Jersey and have uh, went to school in Boston, Mass at a women's college, got a degree in human services and started my career uh, in college admissions and then in the nonprofit world. Uh, And I was very fortunate to be able to uh, raise a family, go home, raise a family. And while I was raising my three children, I homeschooled them. Okay. And so they were homeschooled from birth to the time that they went to college. And during that time, I was very active in our homeschool associations. So uh, by that time, we had moved to Florida and I was uh, involved in the local, uh, then ran the state organization, which is the biggest in the country with a 10,000 number uh, convention and then on the national level. So I got very involved in leadership uh, with uh, the home with home education and homeschooling Uh, and how I got into working for the government was I was living in Collier County. I was a 4-H leader, and so I was very involved with the extension office. Okay. And, and the extension office had a position that they were opening up, and it was to help low and moderate income people become first-time home buyers. Okay. And I said, gosh, I just went through that. I could do it. And I started with extension and became a family and consumer science agent, Uh, went from part-time to full-time. Then a position opened up in the county as the director of human services, and I went and uh, got that position. While I was there, uh, it was very typical government work. Uh, we decided that we were going to merge departments because what does government usually do? Right, Things right. like that. So by the time I left, I was the director of housing, human, and veteran services. Uh, I happened to, uh, during that time, uh, have some serious losses, including a husband of 27 years. And as a result of that and some other things, I ended up reconnecting with uh, a college beau who lived in Burlington, Vermont. So I went up to be with him in Burlington, Vermont, exchanging white sand for white snow, (laughs) uh, political (laughs) whiplash, uh, going to Burlington, Vermont, where Bernie Sanders was the mayor uh, and ran uh, their community development block grant program programs, okay. affordable housing up there, and uh, then got very involved with uh, the homeless community and the continuum of care. Okay. Uh, I was there for seven years and uh, won too many slips on the snow. Uh, came home crying and said, can we leave? <laughs> and uh, and so was able to start looking at positions down in Florida. Okay. Uh, and Pasco was one of the three places that I interviewed. Uh, it was uh, quite the uh, shock or amusement when I walked in to, um, I interviewed for a position of uh, operations manager, walked in and saw Kathy Pearson and Kathy and I served on the state board of uh, human services directors Mm -hmm. back in the day. So we knew each other and it was uh, exciting to come to Pasco. A lot of opportunities here. Right. All right. All right. Well, I started in law enforcement, actually, at 21 years old with uh, Sarasota County. I'm a native Floridian, uh, Homestead Air Force Base I was born at. Unfortunately, it's not the same now. So I worked uh, with Sarasota County for a couple of years, went to Manatee County, did corrections officer uh, for about five years. 
And then I transitioned into um, a deputy sheriff on the patrol. And I stayed there through about the end of 2005. Um, I was a field training officer, which is one of the things I truly enjoyed doing in law enforcement. My wife and I decided to relocate to Tennessee. Not sure why, but <laughs> no, it was a, it was a good opportunity to get a change and take our kids up there. And um, you know, crime was getting bad, and we had just had the year of hurricanes down here, so we decided we'd go up there. Um, and I worked for a sheriff's office up there for several years, and then decided that I really didn't want to continue in law enforcement until I retired. So. I started looking around just at different things, and a job with the housing authority in Kingsport, Tennessee opened up. And so I did supportive housing with chronically homeless, disabled folks, as well as the HOPWA program, which was for individuals or families with um, AIDS or HIV. And did that for about, oh gosh, I was seven years, almost eight years there. Uh, moved up into a role of the grants and redevelopment manager my last year. So I did a little more, uh, less client interaction and more office-based mm -hmm. work. And um, unbeknownst to me, my wife wanted to move back to Florida. And her uh, hint was here, you need to apply for this job in Pasco County. <laughs> and I said, uh, that's not really my wheelhouse. I don't do that side of housing. Oh, you're, that's okay. And lo and behold, um, here we are. Um, interviewed with Marcy during the pandemic, uh, did a uh, Skype interview, and I okay. was really impressed with her and her staff and um, connected real well, I think. And then we happened to have a vacation plan to Bradenton for a couple weeks later. And so it worked out that I could come for an in-person interview. And um, she offered me the job. We, um, I looked around a little in different places in Florida on where to live and whatnot. Um, we were renting a place in Trinity, and my mother and my wife's mother lives with us, as well as our adult daughter. So we had a real challenge finding houses. Right. Um, yeah. And so we recently actually bought up in Homosassa. Okay. Um, and so we'll see how long that lasts. Right. Um, it's a really big house, and when our, our parents aren't there, I don't think we'll... <laughs> Right. Stay there. But um, I've enjoyed being here with Pasco. I am uh, had the opportunity to do Toastmasters and the leadership development program. Um, we're getting ready to do our stretch project here right. next month. Right, right. So it's it's been a great experience yeah. here. Right. Well, I always learn something when I ask that question. <laughs> so and it's always interesting to see the different threads and how mm -hmm. people went through different parts of their career and then ended up here in Pasco County to join, join our team and what the work we're doing here. So kind of moving on, tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy. I mean, you both obviously very different backgrounds uh, and both different from mine. Uh, so tell us, how did you develop your leadership philosophy and, and what that uh, is? I kind of take mine as a combination of people that I've worked for that were mm -hmm. good leaders. Um, some from Marcy and I had a couple at the housing authority in Tennessee that were really, um, really instrumental in kind of guiding me and, and letting me see what the leadership was. Um, one of the key things is you, you've got to be willing to do things yourself as well. If you're going to ask your team to do something, be involved with it. Right. Um, be willing to get in there and get your hands dirty if you need to. Uh, don't be detached. Um, that being said, I like to let people make their own decisions and run their their projects that they're doing and just kind of step back and be available. Um, I think coaching folks is is important and allowing them to have buy-in. Right. If if you don't have employee buy-in, I think you are um, you're going to struggle. Right, right, right. And Marcy. So I I would um, echo uh, what he said. I um, am very much. Uh, uh, lead by example and just get get into the trenches. Sometimes that has served me well. Sometimes that hasn't. Right. But I never want uh, to feel like anybody I work with feels like I'm asking them to do something that I wouldn't do myself, right. uh, which is kind of old school, but it has served me uh, well most of the time. A good example of that was we were doing a document uh, destruction a uh, couple of years ago where we were preparing to move to our new location and uh, it was time to destroy some files and and I went 
with them to the incinerator. And uh, they kept on saying, you know, we one of the guys kept on saying, you're not going to be able to handle this. It's going to smell. <laughs> and, you know, did uh, you know, I wasn't physically the best person to bring right. to the job, but I was uh, I, I did it because mm-hmm. I wasn't going to ask them to do something. Uh, and then the other thing that kind of is part of my life philosophy is I'll go to a, a favorite proverb of mine, mm-hmm. which is your gift makes room for you and ushers you before great men. And I just feel that when you, uh, and I'll speak for myself, when I'm doing what I'm called to do and doing what I'm good at, it it, it just paves the way. And I, and I would also encourage that with the people that I work with. If you're in your wheelhouse and f- and given the opportunity to really shine, then that gift will make way for you. Right. And, and you both have come into your where you are today, really what I would call a non-traditional path. Right. You, you know, your background in, you know, homeschooling and leadership and in, in those organizations and then through the sheriff and law enforcement into what you're doing today. So how does that that non-traditional path help you in your day to day work? Well, I think I've worked with so many different individuals, um, groups of people at the sheriff's office because I worked you work the the depressed areas or the downtrodden areas of the county, and then you might end up going out to something that's brand new that's gated with with half million dollar houses. So you you treat everybody the same. Um, nobody's more important based on where you live or what you do than this person over here. Um, so I think and and I think your passion for what you're doing has to come through. People have to think you're interested in them and that you care. Right. Um, we used to be told at least, even if you don't care, at least make it look like you're caring. Right. Um, and I, I don't subscribe to that because I do care. Right. But that was just something that that's always struck me. You know, make make sure that the people know you're you're there for them. Right. 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 I think in addition to that, the the non traditional path and and it's funny that you say that because when I became the director of human services I said finally my degree <laughs> right. I, you know I mean I, finally I'm I've got my degree so I had my undergraduate in human services and my graduate in public administration I'm like finally it it all comes together but um but for me it really helps me when it comes to hiring because okay. I'm able. Uh, to and I want other people to be able to connect their soft skills, you know, because because uh, not everything is traditional, and especially in our line of work. For you know, Jeff said, you know, he wasn't doing specifically the kind of housing we do, but when you look at a grant and say he was able to follow a grant, understand the different kinds of populations served, that's transferable. So I want to be able to see that in the people that we hire and bring on. Is what are those transferable skills that you could bring to the table. And um, and so that I think is the most important part of my tr- non-traditional background right. is is seeing that in other people. Right, right, right. Well, I, I think I have a non-traditional background too, you know, coming into this job. So that's one reason I ask. Yes, they're all different. And, and I think they bring a lot of different things to the table other than just the standard, you know, traditional methods. Right. So, so, you know, as you were moving through your career, um, when and how did you kind of realize you wanted to lead, lead others and, and be kind of a leader in an organization? So I remember it started when I was in fourth grade. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were putting together a, a party for the teacher. I don't remember specifically, was she retiring? What was it? And I started organizing the class. Mm-hmm. And and I think that a lot of my background in, in school specifically, then in, in high school, we were in a very progressive town and uh, we got into a time where the parents were, no, get back to the basics. And I organized a week-long program to bring parents in to see all the non-traditional things we were doing right. and how beneficial it was. So I think that it started with organization and planning, because that's definitely my wheelhouse and my gift, but realizing that you can't make changes and 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 move issues ahead unless you have people that follow you. 
So, so that's what leadership became to me is that passion to do things, passion to make a difference, but to bring people along with me uh, in, in leadership. So, uh, you know, as I said, I uh, did that with homeschooling. Uh, you know, my, my parents uh, were in business and I've never been in, in business, uh, but I've always been involved in issues that matter to me. And, uh, you know, my late husband said, would you finally just start making money doing it? And so I went, you know, so then I got a job and now I get paid to do right, it. Right. So, um, really formal leadership has only been in the last few years. Okay. That's something I desired to do, but I look back and reflect and, um, early in my career, I was a field training officer where you ride basically one-on-one -on -one with a deputy for uh, four weeks and you're evaluating this person, giving them feedback, you're giving the supervisors feedback. So in that respect, I did do some leadership then without even realizing it at right. the time. Um, once I got into housing, I kind of, I looked at um, some different options after a couple of years and started thinking more seriously about um, leadership. And I went back to uh, get my MBA and we had some good instruction in that. So I started to, to more seriously focus on that and kind of look for different positions. Um, and obviously this one came open. So um here we are. Right, right, right. So, so in terms of leadership, you know, who's kind of been the biggest influence on your life and, you know, how did that work? Well, I, I mentioned my parents. I think that um, they were, their work ethic is just um, un, unmatched, right? you know, and that's, and it, and it's funny because as you're growing up with it, there's so many things that you resent. Uh, you know, my parents had their own business and, you know, uh, we all just joke now, but at the time it was frustrating. We talked nothing about the bit, all we talked about at dinner was the business <laughs> and things like that. So there were, a lot, but in retrospect, I think that that core value of hard work. And then I appreciated what Jeff said earlier about different people. So uh, I think that they're different people have stuck out mm -hmm. in my mind, uh, um, that have been, uh, exemplary leaders or at least things that they did were just stood out. So for example, while I was in Collier County, um, a County manager who's no longer with us, uh, just stood out to me as a remarkable leader. He, um, he, uh, kept uh, an ongoing fight with the clerk of courts um, <laughs> that went right. probably already to the Florida Supreme Court. It's right. it's probably in record somewhere. Right. And and it was, you know, I, I just really appreciated the fact that he always had our back and it didn't become personal with the de de department directors, but it was a, a county thing. And then, you know, you talk about different backgrounds and knowledge of what we do at that. We had a legislative delegation come by t with the county asks, right? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to have to talk about the one social service program, which never gets on the list, right? right? The right. roads get on the list, the bridges get on the list, but never a social service program. So my program was a choked program. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to have to explain this program to the senators and the congressmen. No, the county manager did it and he nailed it. And I said, wow, I didn't even think he <laughs> knew a clue about what we did, but he nailed it. Right. And I just thought that that was just exemplary. And to move up to this, I, I also want to give a shout out to, uh, to my direct supervisor, Kathy Pearson. She's got, um, political acumen that I think is just really incredible. And she'll call me and say, well, have you considered this or have you talked to a commissioner on that? And I'm like, ah. You know, I'm I'm doing the work and I don't think in terms of that. So those are things that have stood out to me in my career that have influenced me as a leader. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not sure I can nail what y'all do. See? But I would but probably we'll, get we'll, close. We'll, we'll I'd get the ballpark. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd probably. Probably. Ballpark, so. um, I would say my mom and grandmother, my mom was a single mother, late 70s, early 80s, and wasn't as common. So um, that that was... Uh, she's just a very hardworking, uh, strove, strives for excellence. And then my grandmother, her mother, actually um, raised 
four kids in the low 50s and 60s uh, as a single parent. Her husband had passed away. So my mom was also raised by a single parent, uh, different in that mom divorced and, and grandma's right, was, right. was otherwise. But I look up to both of them as strong uh, strong leaders. And then career-wise, I've had several supervisors um, in law enforcement that I would say were good leaders, things I've picked up from them, tidbits. Uh, in that realm, though, I've had some that were not. And so you always say, I'm, I'm not going to be that type or I'm not going to do that. And then my my two supervisors with the housing authority before I came here, um, Wendy was one of them, and she was very instrumental watching her work. Uh, she could run circles around anyone, put a put a kid with intention deficit hyperactivity out there, and she'll run circles around them. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was very influential. And then um, her boss was Maria, and she was just watching her in her position. Um, and I, I take some from Marcy now. Um, she'll, as she said about Kathy, she'll put something out there. Did you think of this or have you done this? What about? And, and it gives you that other, right. oh, well, we could try that. Right. Um, so I'm in a position right now where I feel like we have, and I have really good leadership, um, for my team. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that. You all do. Our department's yeah, great. And, and yeah, and I like, you know, what, what I, you know, this is our 12th episode and, you know, kind of one of the consistent threads is we almost always hear family and mm -hmm. it is part of this is someone in the family, usually a parent, but not always, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, but someone played a role in the, the child's development up through the teenage years to help kind of guide that those leadership skills and philosophy. So that's, you know, that's always Always interesting to hear, but it's been a pretty common theme of how much, you know, those parents or a single parent like yours have an impact on kids. Um, so as you've gone through your career, um, talk about what you know, lessons that you'd maybe like to share um, of, of things you've seen and how leadership has impacted that environment. So one of the th things that I, I, on a personal level. So I'll talk about maybe something personal yeah, and then yeah, professional. Right. So, you know, we've all had, um, our, those tests, you know, what kind of leader are you or what mm -hmm. are your gifts right. and things like that. And, and if you're honest, a lot of us, there, there are these wonderful people that are totally balanced. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of those, you know? And, and so I, tend to be extremely task oriented. And so for me, my biggest challenge as a leader is to balance out my task orientation with people skills. And I tell the story that I could come into the office and I could walk through the office and say, did you do this? Did you do this? Can you remember to do this? And that would be my day. And I realized that if we're going to end homelessness, if we're going to change the track of affordable housing in our county, if we're going to revitalize neighborhoods, I can't do that by myself. Right. I need to have a team of people. I need community buy-in. I need those people skills. So I have to remind myself to balance out my normal, what I would consider my normal personality right. with uh, people skills to, to build those relationships. So people come alongside to accomplish the vision and the mission of our, of our department. Right. Uh, I'll share something. Um, during the pandemic, we, um, back in Tennessee had a, uh, work from home if you could. So some of the upper management actually could, and I was in, in that category. So I did. Um, once we started funneling back to the office, one of the other supervisors um, stayed out and he supervised uh, uh, 10 or 15 people and he was out of the office that whole time. And that really struck me as I, I couldn't be that type of person. I, I, I can't see my team working and I'm at home because I'm afraid of the pandemic or something to that effect. So um, Marcy has has basically kept us going forward mm -hmm. through the whole pandemic right. that the community development office is one of those that's been open with with limited, um, very limited people out and so I've seen from from her that the passion is there to lead, 
um, there's there's no barriers that can't be overcome. So I like that. Um, like to see that, and that's that's something I'm trying to take and use in my um, my right. job and my life. Yeah, the the pandemic's driven a lot of leadership challenges, <laughs> right? It's yeah. obviously nothing we've experienced in our careers, right? And and so you know. Either from my level or from where y'all are, it's been completely different how you lead and deal with people. And, you know, thankfully kind of we've been working on a philosophy of our, taking care of our people. And so that's led a lot of the decisions mm -hmm. and how do we, how do we take care of our people, allow them to do their jobs, but also try to maintain that balance. Right. And that's, that's been a running challenge for <laughs> now. What, what are we going on? 20 months, 18, 19, 19, 18, 19, 19 yeah. months. Right. And so, but uh, you know, I think that the focus on that, making sure we take care of our people is and every department's done it a little differently is I think really helped in general us kind of mm -hmm. lead our way through that, you know, as opposed to some other ways we could have, we could have gotten that. So, and, and, you know, I'm an engineer, so, you know, I think most things that I dealt with growing up in my career, I could solve with math, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you, what you work in can't be solved. There are no easy solutions. No. You are in very unique work in very unique environment that, you know, it's not simple. There is no magic formula out there. Like there is on the, and they're not magic formulas on the engineering side, but it's, they're complicated problems, but they can be solved with science and in technology. So, um, so as you go through your career and continue to go through your career, what are some ways that you continue to use to work, to build your leadership skills? You know, you talked about, you know, being from task oriented to soft people skills. Well, that's, I mean, 90% of engineers, that's what we are, right? You know, we're task oriented, you know, what, what's, what's a people skill, right? You know, so how do you continue to build those skills? Uh, I think you continue to get feedback from folks. Um, the skip meetings obviously are one way the county does that. Mm -hmm. um, I try to encourage my team to say, what can we do better? How can we do it better? Or what do you need for me to do it better? Because I think my role is to put people in an area where they can succeed mm -hmm. and coach them along. So in order to know if we're effective, we've got to have a way of getting feedback. Evaluations, obviously, are, are one of those. Um, the skip meetings, those sort of things. And sometimes you just have to sit back yourself and reflect. And I think um, just think, is there something better I could do? Is this the way I want this to go? Is it working this way? Um, I think having a one-on-one -on -one with employees from time to time or your team members or even a, a, a team meeting can kind of get you um, maybe get some ideas on what you need to do to improve things. And I, I have done a little more research on leading now in the last few years. I read a book by um, Jim Mathis, the uh, former defense secretary, and I really enjoyed reading his leadership journey um, through the military and through the Middle East situation, and and of course with what's going on now, um, that's that's totally different. But I try to look at people like that and what they've done, um, read their books or their articles, those sort of things. And on, ongoing training can help too. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I've supported Jeff and and a number of our team members to be involved in any of the leadership training programs that are here in the county, and I think that those are all very helpful. I've done those in the past. I think that professional associations are really important, um, and even our uh, fellow directors uh, to <laughs> to to have that kind of networking to learn right. from each other. I know that you've brought this up before, and I would add this to a challenge of leadership is that it can be lonely at the top, you know, whether you're at your top or right. my top or at your top. Um, it's, uh, it's oftentimes a lonely position. Um, my kids, uh, you know, will often say to me, mom, you're the boss. You could do what you want. No, it doesn't work <laughs> that way. And, um, and so having, um, uh, having a safe place to vent is really important. Um, and, uh, and knowing who you can talk to and get that kind of feedback is, is really important. And I find a lot of that, not only here in the County, but again, in professional associations, because in our line of work, people are doing this kind of thing all over the state and all right. over the country. So it really helps to bounce ideas off of and how different people handle 
political problems, handle getting community involved, getting nimbyism when it comes to right. affordable housing, you know, getting that kind of information from other right. people. Um, and I, I and just uh, absolutely self-reflection, you know, can what could I have done better? Um, you know, we I, I seem to have a pandemic situation on a <laughs> weekly basis. And, you know, and it was very helpful to have something happen a few days ago. And then now I'll be able to go to our team and say, what could we have done better? Would there right. have been a better way to respond? Did we did we do the right thing? Are there other things that we can do? And um, and and we're learning. And I think being teachable right. is so important. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that never really ends, right? Oh, never. Yeah, right? Um, you know, and in what you're dealing with, you know, every circumstance is very unique, and yet you can still learn from it and apply those lessons to other circumstances. And you are doing an amazing job. I mean, you're, I think I saw you're over 200 people. 218 family. as yeah, of today. See, I was gonna... Seven short of our goal yeah. of people housed. So for people that are listening, uh, we uh, made a, a uh, goal last year and the Board of County Commissioners approved it to house 225 of our homeless neighbors. And uh, we are at 218. We had hoped to make it a little bit faster than what we did. Right. Uh, but the housing market has just about shot, shut down, you know, and people are not moving. And it's really, we have the money and we have the people, but we don't have a place to put them. And so as things open up, people are going. So it's really been remarkable. Right. Yeah, that's no, that's it shows a great, you know, leadership and yeah. work that your team's done with the partners, right? It, it, with the community absolutely. partners, because this is not something that's solved no. by one entity or one agency. Not so, at all. Yeah. So, so as you, um, over the course of your career, <clears throat> what are some ways you've kind of worked to identify and raise new leaders? Because <clears throat> we all are eventually going to, you know, move on and we want somebody to replace us that will continue to lead. How do you do that? So I go back to um, my life philosophy, which is your gift will make room for me for you. And I will also use the the, the uh, he that is faithful and little much will be added. So right. I look to people who are responsible and and do a good job with what they've been given mm -hmm. and then add to that responsibility. And um, and that has served me well. Um, I have uh, had a couple of people um, in my past that I've mentored and um, and and watched. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about a rehab specialist that I had when I was in Collier County and just did an amazing job. He was doing 25 rehabs a month uh, and he was just incredible. Well, he was also uh, a veteran. And so the veteran's officer position became available and I encouraged him to apply for it. And everybody thought I was crazy. Um, but then I brought together a team of people to interview and the long-term person didn't get it. He got it because he, um, because he was responsible. He had known, uh, how to communicate effectively. And then he took the division to another level. So, um, so, uh, that, that's what I look at. I look at, are you doing a good job with what you have? Are you passionate? Are you responsible? And then what can we do to add to it? Now, not everybody wants to move up into leadership. Right. Right, right. Uh, some people are very comfortable where they're at, but some people have a fire in them. And right. those are the ones you want to identify and, and mentor and move forward with. Right. I had a mentor uh, when I was in the military in the National Guard that uh, said, you know, if, if you want that next promotion, then you should be acting like you have already been promoted and be doing the work at that level. And then the promotion will come. Right. So very, very similar mm -hmm. to that. So I would echo a lot of what Marcy said. Um, one of the things I like to see if somebody's going to move into a new role or leadership role is, is their passion for the job. Are they doing the job because they want to do it or are they going through the motions? Mm -hmm. um, you want to give folks responsibility that, you know, will complete whatever it is, but you also, um, I don't think you want to put somebody in there just because their seniority, um, they've been here forever, they know how to do it all. Well, we should probably just promote them. Um, you, you want to put somebody in there that's going to do the job, has a passion for it, and th that enjoys it. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't enjoy the work, you're you're not going to have the passion. And right. it's, it's, you're, it, it'll come through. It'll be seen. It may take a while, but it'll, it'll come through. Right. And, and, you know, even with the successes of the 218 
you know, housed. You go sometimes a long time without seeing some of those successes that you can celebrate. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's a pretty rough, rough Mm -hmm. area to be in. So, oh, that's really good. That's a challenge as a leader is to not get discouraged. And then knowing that, you know, that my discouragement will just, it, it, it's contagious. Right. So you don't want that to be contagious. Right. So, you know, so you, it, it, that's, that's considerable. So. Right. Great. Hey, this has been really great. So we're going to go off the, the <laughs> leadership questions, go to the lightning okay. round, kind of let people get to know a little bit more about you a oh, little no. bit. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> What's my favorite? Yeah. That kind if of you stuff. Yeah. 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 What's your spirit animal? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. one that I got asked a few the, weeks ago, months ago. So, so. you're, you're going to get even. Yeah. I'm going to get even for those things. So, so I'm, I'm going to start with the standard, the officer parks and rec. Uh, Parks and Rec. Okay. People tell me that I'm just like, uh, and I don't, don't watch either of them, but par- people <laughs> tell me that, uh, that 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 lead character is me. Okay. <laughs> I've not, t- in neither one. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but now the office, I like some of their, their yeah. stuff. I've seen right. clips, but right, right. I'm not, not a regular watcher of that. Okay. No, no, that's fine. They're on both on Netflix, I think. Yeah, so um, when we have time. Yeah. When you have time. Right. So no, um, well, I, you know, my daughter went through them all, and then <laughs> and then she told and you. Then, well, yeah. well, no, I, I watched the- them all. I grew them up. I yeah, well, no, didn't grow up watching them, but watched them. And then uh, we said, okay, well, you've done those, so now go back to Seinfeld. And then after mm-hmm. Seinfeld, okay, now go back to Cheers. You you just gotta, oh, wow. gotta keep building yeah, yeah. right through those. So yeah, I forgot what Cheers was like, and I hadn't seen it in such a long time. <laughs> so dawn or dusk, morning person, evening person, dusk. Yeah, well, I love sunrises and sunsets, so I'll take <laughs> well, either of them. Yeah, right, yeah. right, 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 right. <laughs> so what's the place you most want to travel now? Nowhere. Nowhere? Okay. <laughs> All right. It's, it, you know, I just recently came back from Maine, and I, I'll tell you it was um, – it was a happy dance when we landed back in Florida. Okay. So it's right now it's, it's sort of tough. I think we are getting ready to go on vacation and we're going to venture as far as Georgia. But, um, I, I think this is a tough time to in, travel. In Maine would be a beautiful this time of year. It was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, although it was their warmest days. <laughs> and so we were going into <laughs> stores. It was 90 degrees people and they were giving out water. Mm-hmm. Stay safe out there. Yeah. And I'm like, we're from Florida. <laughs> right. It's like this every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh gosh, I, I have several. Um, I really want to go to Chicago and watch a Cubs game at Wrigley okay. Field. That's and then second to that would be going to Boston and Fenway Park. Fenway, yeah. Okay, yeah. We did a, a lot of ball fields mm-hmm. when we were younger. Um, and didn't make either of those, but mm-hmm. it did do some others, mainly some on the West Coast. And then I've been in mm-hmm. the old Tiger Stadium in Detroit. Um, so, so I went uh, to school in Boston, and yeah. Fenway Park was in our backyard. Close, right? And yeah. in, mm-hmm. on reunions, we've gone to tours of Fenway mm-hmm. Park. Um, what I just can't, and I'm not a sports person, so don't even get into sports <laughs> with me. But it is just a long game, and I think we sat in a Red Sox game when they had like this big argument on the field, and and it was okay. We've had enough. Like four hours later, right. and then we miss like the most important part of it. But um, <laughs> but it, it it's it's not the same when you right. watch it on TV. Right? So. No, it's no, not. it's a different game. It's, yeah. it's a well, it's the same thing with um. You know, I didn't grow up watching hockey. But watching hockey in person is completely different oh, yeah. than watching hockey on TV. Yeah. And so, and of course, with two time Stanley Cup champions, mm-hmm. you have to watch a little you Florida, watch yeah. a little Florida hockey here, the, yeah. the Lightning. So, so what's your favorite season? Fall. Fall, which we're you know, which we, thirty days from, right? But yeah. you're not going to really notice it here. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I have a favorite. I uh, when we were in Tennessee, I liked summer. Okay. Um, but I, I liked all three except for winter. I mean, spring, summer, and fall were good. Um, so I don't know right now whether I really have anything particular that that I like better. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I, I will, will, spirit we'll, animal? No, I'm not going <laughs> to do spirit on. animal. Come no, on. I have the answer. Okay. Go ahead. What is it? A bumblebee. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had to, when I got asked that question, I had to go research. And so, okay, what's the, what's the right way to do it? And so I, you know, I got my Myers-Briggs profile. And so I just Googled, okay, animal, spirit animal, My- Myers-Briggs. And then that's what popped up the, I can't remember the owl, whatever the, the, the owl was, the great horned owl or something. Do you know, I had a job mm. interview 
uh, with a, a county that was dividing up their whole county based on that. And wow. they and they asked me uh, that question based on whatever. They were like, oh, my gosh, we don't have a whatever it was. I don't right, even remember. Right, 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 and I'm right. like, oh, boy, yeah. that was different. Yeah, I had a friend that uh, <laughs> would, in, would, would ask a question like that in an interview, not to hear the answer, but to see the reaction. Yeah. Yeah, not to hear the answer, but to see how the interview mm -hmm. reacted to that kind of off the wall question. So my kids um, would do that, like, it, <laughs> and for some reason, I don't know where they got it from. And I'm like, no, we don't ask those kind of questions. And then all this started, right. and you're getting those questions too. And I'm like, where did this all come from? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank uh, you. Marcy and Jeff, I really appreciate it. And I really enjoyed the show. Uh, it was great to have you both on here. Uh, and special thanks to our media relations team, you know, who makes this all possible every day. They, they pull some amazing stuff together, both for this and for a lot of the other things that we do here. And then thank you for joining us for this episode of Pasco Podcast. I'm Dan Biles. And until the next one. For more information on Pasco County government, please visit mypasco.net and check us out on Facebook and Twitter.